have our, it's always good to have our ladies praise team. It used to be our ladies praise team plus one. Now I notice it's the ladies praise team plus two. <laughs> All right, if you want to take your Bibles out this morning, there won't be anything up on the screen. So if you want to plan ahead and take your Bibles and open to Galatians chapter 2, Put a bookmark there, Colossians chapter 2, you can put a bookmark there. And if you really, really are aggressive, you want to open to Romans 12, put a bookmark there. Galatians 2, Colossians 2, Romans 12. Why does the world hate Jesus Christ? Now, that's a question that we should be able to answer by now. And the answer to that question is this, the world hates him for no good reason. That's it. The world hates Jesus for no good reason. His errand of mercy, because that's really what it was. When Jesus came to this world, it was an errand of mercy. And his errand of mercy to this world was to offer us eternal life, forgiveness of sins, a place in heaven, simply by asking for it for faith. But in doing so, it also means something else has to happen. It also means that we have to admit that we are hopeless in and of ourselves to make any of that effective. So what Jesus' offer does is it exposes our very best at not being good enough and never will be. And it's that right there where the rejectors of Jesus find their hate of him. Now, you've got to remember, they don't hate Jesus because he's powerful or compassionate. In fact, they like that. They like a Jesus who's powerful and compassionate. They, they, They like a Jesus who loves me for all that I am and will accept me for all that I am but they will hate the Jesus who seeks to change all that I am. And they'll hate his followers. Because that's the very same message that we take to a dark world in sin. We are not of this kingdom any longer. Our kingdom is not here. Jesus made that clear in the darkest time of his life, standing before Pontius Pilate. It's one of the reasons why Pilate found him not guilty. Pilate could look out the window and go, I don't see any army out there. You're not a problem to me. No, that's right, because I'm not building my kingdom here. My kingdom is not of this world. But here's the thing, something Pilate didn't understand, something that the world doesn't understand. We come back to this fallen realm as ambassadors to convince the citizens here to switch sides. Remember, we talked about this last week. It was kind of a preface to all of this, this whole idea of switching seats and switching sides. Switching seats is kind of the the personal response. That's usually what we start off with. I get saved, and I want more of Jesus. And before I know it, literally speaking, but also figuratively speaking, I find myself sitting in different places in life. All of a sudden, I don't sit comfortably with, with the groups and people and things and places I used to be. But at the same time, these people are still my friends, and I want them to know that something has changed in my life and I want them to have the same thing. So I've switched seats, but at the same time, I'm also asking people to switch sides. See, that's the the issue that the unbeliever, which is all of us at one time, must figure out. When they're presented with this person of Jesus, when they're presented with this errand of mercy, they've got to figure out, is it better for me up there as it were, or am I still doing okay down here? But for the believer in Jesus Christ, We have something else to figure out. The person who has decided already that this kingdom that is not of this world, that is something that I want. And so I've trusted in Jesus. I mean, I'm so messed up down here. It's not really a tough decision. I'm going to accept the offer that Jesus gives. For this person, a different issue comes up about now what would be considered their new found Christian life. And this right here is what's going to officially for us, bring to an end our series on abiding, something we've been looking at for probably the last eight months with some breaks here and here, here and there. So this kind of brings to end our, our series on abiding and this whole idea of, of hatred. Because a new concern arises for us, and that is, for, as a believer in Christ, what do I do now about my good works? Because I realize fully that my good works, before I got saved, had no part to play in my salvation. I realize that now. But now that I'm a Christian, the way that I live, the things that I do, the things that I say, are they not all being added up? 
Does living for Jesus now involve a series of personal efforts and works? Things like obedience and repentance and sacrifice and service. You ever thought about that? That's a good question to ask. It's a very needed question to ask. When I wasn't saved, and I might have been, you know, sensitive to God, you know, and, and, and Jesus and, and the religious life and the spiritual life in the church, when I may have been sensitive to those things, I thought that what I needed to do was to extend all the good effort that I could in order to please God. How, I mean, that would be in the way that I would define what pleased God. That would be in the way in which I would define good works. Because I figured, hey, after all, since I'm sensitive to God and I realize God is good and he wants me to do good things, I'm going to have to have something to show to him, right? When I stand before him one day and I'm judged. You know, hey, God, uh, you know, uh, I never murdered anybody. Never robbed any banks. That's a pretty good kid, you know, to my parents and stuff like that. And all of a sudden I realize God tells me it doesn't work like that. Stop all of the effort, meaning stop doing all those, those things that you think are good to earn my favor. Don't stop doing good things. Doing good things will at least help you to sleep better at night, but don't think that doing good things will earn my favor and instead trust in me because it's only faith that is going to matter. But now that I'm saved, it seems that God is now asking me to do a lot of things. But what happens to my faith now that I'm saved? What role does it play? Well, communion is going to help us to kind of sort some of that out here this morning. There is a relationship between faith and obedience as it applies to our observance of the Lord's table and really to any part of our, of our Christian life. When daily fresh faith is absent, the saved life can lose some of its joy, some of its expectation of God's powerful presence, and we can kind of become driven by works after that. That sincere saint, that one who, who might slip in that daily fresh dependence on faith, well, that, because they're sincere, they're still going to be sincerely serving their Savior. They're going to be out there doing the things that, that, you know, that they know that God wants them to do. They're going to work hard at it, but it's just not a lot of fun anymore. And it becomes really more of like an exhortation in their life. It's just something God tells me to do rather than an expectation. Yeah, I still read my Bible. Yeah, I still pray regularly. I still perform that ministry thing that God has me involved. I teach that class. I visit those people. I organize that event. I help wherever I can. Because I know that that's the kind of thing that makes God happy. But i got to tell you honestly... I'm not happy. I've lost something. I'm not talking about losing my sincerity. I haven't lost my commitment, though some believers have come to that point. But what I've lost is that expectation, that excitement that used to be there in doing all of those things. Ever feel like that? You feel like that right now? Now, some people don't. I mean, it just seems like there are some people out there that, that never kind of experience that kind of thing. And that's great. There are some of those people out there that even on their worst days, and they realize they have bad days. They're not the people that deny that nothing bad ever goes wrong in their life. But there are those people that even on their worst days, they are excited about Jesus, and they serve him like that, and you can see it. There's kind of a biblical picture of that. You can kind of see the difference in that in Paul and Peter. Paul was the kind of guy that made no bones about letting his readers know the difficult things that he went through. He let them know of the trials that he experienced in life. But at the same time, this is the guy that constantly wrote about rejoice. Rejoice evermore, and again I say rejoice. Be, I, I'm an example, be like me. But then you kind of had Peter. We know Peter's life, right? Especially before Jesus went to the cross. Peter was the kind of guy, he loved his Lord, kind of couldn't figure out a lot of the stuff that Jesus would do and get, would get mad at Jesus sometimes. And Jesus would just tell him, look, this is what I want you to do. And Peter's kind of the guy, you get the picture where he just kind of kicks the stones. You know, fine, I'll just do it anyhow, you know. I love Jesus and I'll do it. But I don't, it doesn't make any sense to me. I don't know why we're doing this. If you're that kind of person, if you're the Paul person, you're the one that says, man, you know, I know dark times come in my life but I'm excited about Jesus. I keep it up. But there are so many others that can lose something along the way. 
even though they still plug away faithfully. What is the difference there? Because both have basically reached the same end result, right? Both of them are still serving Jesus, but one of them is not having a lot of fun. I was talking to a friend of mine just on Friday, it was. He lives in Chicago. He's one of those two or three or four you know, dear friends that are in that small circle that you can tell anything to. And he was telling me about his son. I don't know his son that well, um, but I've met him a couple times. Nice, good Christian young man, married. They had children almost immediately in their marriage. He's a track coach um, in a small college in Iowa. And he was telling me that his son is just really burned out. He went through some debilitating um, disease for about six months, literally was debilitated. I mean, a track coach, debilitated. And there are just several other things that happened in his life. And he said, yeah, right now, he said, you know, my son is just, they're checking out a couple of other jobs. There's three other states they might move to, small colleges, you know, becoming a, a coach out there and stuff. And I just said to him, you know, uh, that's a good thing. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with investigating. God gives us this, this circle of his will, and we have great freedom inside of it. That's one of the ways we discover God's will. Check things out. I said, they're young. This is a good time for them to do it. And he literally said to me, he said, yeah, he says, my son still loves the Lord, still serves him, but he's just not having any fun. It's exactly the words he said to me. And I said, wow, Russ, that's exactly what we're talking about this Sunday. And I was trying to, to get to the point of, of telling him there's something he needs to focus on that will maybe be the springboard to all of this, and I'll mention it, and we'll get to it in a moment. See, when you're talking about people like that, the people who are excited and those who are not, one of them has lost the vital connection. They've misplaced that vital connection between faith and obedience. So when it comes to the Lord's table, I want to be driven to the question here this morning, why are we here? Why am I doing this this morning? Am I doing this because, hey, you know, it's been in the bulletin for a couple of weeks now, so I guess I probably should. Am I doing this because I say to myself, you know what, you know, I've kind of missed a couple of Sundays here, and this might kind of be my way of making up for that. Well, the best way to answer this is to center on the truths that surround communion. So what we're going to do is just take a couple of minutes, two, three minutes, to analyze faith, and then we're going to analyze faith in relation to the Lord's table. Let's ask the first question. We'll ask two questions this morning. One now and then one when we partake of the cup. How does faith work? How does my faith work? The answer, faith works when I live by trusting Jesus who gave himself freely for me. Let's look at that first passage. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. See, there's, there's all these direct connections here in Galatians 2.20. That's why it is a tremendous passage to know. This is a passage you, all, you really should memorize. There are all these connections. There, when Jesus died, this happened. When Jesus was crucified, this happened. When he rose again, this happened. Now what we read here is that Jesus gave himself up for me. But we can also add something here, too. It doesn't say it in this particular verse, but it's implied because we know from the Gospels that it, not only did Jesus give himself up, but he gave himself up freely. Jesus says things like that about himself. In John chapter 10, he talks about the idea that no one has taken my life from me. I lay it down of my own initiative. I mean, I do this freely. And that's a real key thought here. Because my faith is freely activated to serve my Savior, to obey him, to love him. That is exactly how it rises above my circumstances. The freedom of my faith keeps it above the constraining forces of my circumstances because circumstances will seek to dictate your moods. When things are going good, hey, you know, everything is, hey, I trust Jesus for everything. Isn't he a wonderful Savior? There's nothing wrong with that. We should feel like that. We ought to be giving him gratitude, especially at those times. But what happens when they're not? When I'm really in a low moment of life, thinking to myself, what is going on here? It's not what I prayed for. 
This isn't how it's supposed to be. I didn't have visions or pictures of this kind of thing in my head. And you have a decision to make right there. Will I do what Jesus says just because he tells me to do it? Or, I'm going, or am I going to do it because I want to do it? I really have this desire to do and to be everything that Jesus wants me to do and to be. And even when I may respond to Jesus correctly, you know, that he, he exhorts me, he commands me to do something, but I'm just not feeling it on the inside, that's still better to do. I'm not here to tell you, you know, to back off from that. No, don't. Don't do that at all. Responding to his exhortations is still better than disobedience or rebellion because disobedience and rebellion carries all sorts of their own residual consequences. So even if I'm not feeling it on the inside, fulfill his desire of you. But that's not what you really want, is it? What you really want is to own that desire. You get so much more out of it when faith and trust motivates us to excitement in Jesus. You see, faith works like this. Galatians 2.20, this is how it works. Jesus, you loved me so much that you took my place on the cross. So to obey you right now, in what may be a really difficult time, is something that I do because I know, I know, Galatians 2.20 tells me, I know I can trust you. And it's the cross that becomes my blazing lighthouse in a really, really dark time. It's not about how much I understand my dark times. Because sometimes that's really infuriating to us. When we suffer and agonize through things, and I just cannot figure anything out in my mind with this. And that's not a bad thing, because you've got to remember, we're built that way. This is the way God designed us. We are built to be involved, thinking, creative, inquisitive human beings. We do like to have some handle on the things that happen around us, good or bad. Because I'm not always the one that's able to, to rationally, logically figure things out, to put everything together. But unfortunately, because God's designed us in that way, it just drives us crazy even more. You know, what the tragedy that happened in Virginia Beach, I read about that. Okay, I read about this just a couple days ago, or heard about it two days ago, so things may have changed since the time that I heard about this. At least 11 people killed in a, in a mass shooting. Several who have been wounded as well. And they're calling it a, a workplace incident, workplace violence. Apparently there was a disgruntled employee, came back, whatever. I don't know that I know, I don't know any more details that may have come in in the last day. I listen to these stories because we know that they happen a lot. And I listen to these stories and what really just, I, I cannot figure out, it just kind of brings, it brings more agony to my soul is to think, you know, it's one thing if a person is antagonized at work by their boss, their supervisor, one or two employees, and they, and they just flip out, and they bring a gun, and they kill the people responsible. That's tragic enough. That is terrible enough. I'm not saying it's not tragic. But at least in my mind, I can make a one-to-one -one connection to that. Okay, well, you know, you antagonize, here's what I, it doesn't excuse them for that. But maybe it's something we can look for the next time. You know, maybe we can kind of identify this and prevent this the next time. But when you just randomly come in and shoot, and all these innocent people out there are hurt and killed because of this, my mind can't accept that. And it, to me, it just takes the tragedy and just kind of catapults it even further. What happens is we get dislodged. We get mentally and emotionally bumped around when things happen, these dark times come in, and I just can't figure it out. But for the Christian, when something exceeds all of my limited understanding, what is always there? What is always there piercing the darkness of my life? This is what I wanted my friend to share with his son. Here's the start. Here's the beginning of it all. What is always there piercing the darkness is Galatians 2.20. It's the cross. And I get my bearings back. And I say, oh yeah, I can trust him in that. He didn't fail me then, and he's not going to fail me now. So obedience is all tied up in faith, and faith is all tied up in the character of God. So there's a dynamic here. There's a dynamic for Christian living. The dynamic for Christian living is this. Since Jesus has proven his love for me, I can trust him in every condition of life. 
How does faith work? Let's look at that other passage. Go over to Colossians chapter 2. Go to Colossians chapter 2. Colossians 2, verse 6. How does faith work? It works like this. Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. Having been firmly rooted and now being built up in him and established in your faith, just as you were instructed and overflowing with gratitude. So we realize further that faith is a lifestyle. It's something that I do moment by moment. It's something, as Paul uses the language here, we walk in it. We walk through things. Walking in the New Testament is always the idea of something that's decision by decision, moment by moment, step by step. I trusted him for eternal life. I trusted him for the forgiveness of my sins. I trusted him for heaven. I mean, my gosh, those are really big deals. Absolutely nothing that I could do to make any of that happen. No effort on my part could make any of that happen. Just faith. Well, it's the same thing as you meet every encounter of life, whether they be the mundane things or they might be the monumental things. But here's the thing about monumental incidences in your life. There's not as many of them, but there's a whole lot of mundane things, right? We spent weeks looking at this whole thing, issue two, how literally most of our life is spent in the everyday, and it's in the everyday how I respond in the everyday, how I respond when I walk in faith that determines what happens in the monumental. Remember we brought up this question last week about how there are believers in this world, especially in Muslim-dominated countries, that face the kind of tragedy we don't, mostly. You know, we talked about in West Africa, several Christian churches where gunmen have burst in during services and gunned people down. In Nigeria, a pastor, his daughter, 16 parishioners, while in the service, gunmen burst in, kidnap half the congregation. How do you prepare yourself for something like that? I, I really don't know, except the answer has to be found in the everyday. Those hundreds of decisions that I make as I walk with Jesus every day, and I want to be excited, and I want to be faithful. And I want to trust him for all of that. As I'm living, working, and applying myself to all that I'm called to, I also trust God with every decision, every action, every reaction. It is grace that motivates me. It is gratitude that causes me to respond to his will in everything. Let's look at that one final passage. Romans chapter 12. Romans 12. He says, therefore, I urge you, brethren, verses 1 and 2, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. So I'm living out my Christian life, and I realize that living out my Christian life is not turning off my mind, because that's the way the world looks at faith sometimes. They look at faith as, as you just kind of shutting your mind off to the facts and reality and science and things like that. That's not the case at all. In fact, it's just the opposite. I think, work, and I act better than I ever did before because God is my source of all these things. So it's just a reasonable and rational progression for me to trust him wherever life takes me. So that's the dynamic for Christian living, but now we have a decision. The decision for Christian living is this. If he loved me enough to give himself for me, then he loves me enough to take care of me in the place that I might find myself in right now. I want to know that God is a good God. So that when I'm at that threshold of obedience where God is tugging at my life, maybe I've lost some of that vitality. Maybe I've lost some of that excitement, but God is tugging at my life because something critical has come up, and now I don't know what to do. And he's tugging at my heart. Obey me. Just trust me. Just do what I say right now, even if it's beyond your faculties to figure out at the moment. So when that's happening, what will cause me to listen and respond when nothing else seems to inspire my spirit? The answer is the cross. I must look to the cross. 
I come to his blood-soaked body and I realize that not even this, not even his death could confine his love and power over all of my sin. This is the compelling vitality that we have to bring into the everyday life that we live in our everyday thinking. We're going to do this right now as we prepare ourselves to receive the bread. But before we do that, the servers don't get up yet. If you're here this morning and you're thinking to yourself, you know what, I, I think I've lost some of that divine incentive. Maybe I've lost all of it. I'm at a place right now where I don't even feel comfortable of taking whatever it is that just burdens me right now. I don't even feel comfortable taking my deepest wounds to his cross, which is seen in these elements here. And you don't feel like you have this, this freedom over sin. Then I want to tell you, you are in the right place at just the right time. So before we take the bread, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to invite us right now. Let's all stand together. Let's stand together because we're going to sing. I'm going to invite Rick to come up. He's going to lead us. And as we sing this song, I want you to use the words and the music of this song as your opportunity to tell Jesus, man, I just want to be excited again. Your opportunity, while we're singing this song, just to tell Jesus, get me excited again. I, I want to breathe deeply again at that fresh aroma of your mercy and grace, because he is the Lamb of God. Rick, please lead us. Well, we asked the question, how does faith work? And I want to ask the question, how does the Lord's table work? Why do we do this? How does communion work in relation to my faith? What this does for us right here, what this table does, is it takes us to the central truth of Christianity. Without these elements right here representing a real act in history, if these elements did not represent a real act in history, then this book that I have before me, the book that you have before you, would have no more relevance than the sayings of Confucius. We have no more relevance than any other religious holy book, the Hindu's holy book, the, the Bhagavad Gita. We have no more relevance than reading the Book of Mormon. But the fact is, it did happen. The, the events that, that these elements represent, it did happen. It happened with more verification than even our landing on the moon. You realize that there are still conspiracy groups and people out there that don't believe we land on the moon? I actually had a long conversation with a guy, a Christian guy, and he's someone who served the Lord in his church, and we were at work one time, and he starts the story. And for 10 minutes, I thought he was pulling my leg, telling me about how we didn't really land there, and he's telling me stuff like how the flag was waving in the wind in some of the pictures, and I said, man, I didn't really notice that, you know, and, and something about the shadows going over the site. I mean, he had, he had all this down pat. And I had to tell him, I said, you know, Jerry, I said, you, you got me on this one. I said, I haven't done enough reading on this kind of a thing. And I got to tell you, I'm not going to because I still just believe that we went to the moon. That's all there is to it. This happened with more verification than that. I mean, we've got fulfilled prophecy, a lot of them. We've got written records. We've got eyewitness accounts from a lot of people of his resurrection for 40 days as he, as he walked this earth. In fact, maybe the most powerful evidence we have is the transformation of the disciples' lives. Before the resurrection, basically these guys were cowards when push came to shove. After the resurrection, they were willing to die for their faith as martyrs, and almost all of them did. So isn't it just right that God would make sure? I mean, he's able to look down through the corridors of time and to know that we're going to be called. This is what he wanted to do. He called us to this, this kind of a unique gathering to make sure that we just stay focused on what makes our faith work with power and anticipation. What does the most for me? What does the most for us in our spiritual connection to Jesus? 
and in our connection to one another, when we want to keep those relationships strong and vital, or when they're hurting and I might be retreating in despair. What does the most for us? Well, it's not going to seminars, and it's not reading the latest Christian self-help book. It's not the most recent Christian movie that's been out or that praise music concert from the hottest contemporary group that is out there. Now, there's nothing wrong with those kind of things. I think all of those things and more are very edifying. I like all of those things. But those things actually act more like, you know, that five-hour energy drink? You know, when you're really down? Jack's laughing. He must take these. I don't know. And you're really down. I haven't really had them. I know guys who have. You know, you take a shot at it and go, whoa, man, it really works, man. I'm pepped up and I'm ready to go for about five hours. But because we tend to forget, we tend to get dry and lazy, we need, we need to meditate and to concentrate, and to elaborate, and to celebrate on the cross. It's real and actual power. And its power is real and actual, not only for this life here, but also into eternity. The cross changed my life. The cross gave me life. And it's the cross that powers my life. How can we not rejoice and celebrate so great an event? And that's why we're going to do it. Guys, if you'd please stand again. Let's partake of the cup.